Oke, okay. uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Good evening, Bapak-bapak, uh, Ibu-ibu. Uh, today, uh, we are lucky again. So we have uh, our guest from uh, Victoria University of Wellington, Prof. Andrew Charleston. And of course, with uh, Professor Widodo from Department of Civil Engineering, uh, Universitas Islam Indonesia. Me, myself, I am Nur Idham, uh, Head of Department of Architecture, Universitas Islam Indonesia. I uh, would like to welcome of all of you. Uh, I'm so happy today uh, to have this uh, very nice uh, discussion about the architecture and structural system especially deal with the uh, earthquake. As we talked uh, last week, we have uh, discussed about how should architect plan uh, their building related to the column configurations, uh, bearing wall, and so on, and et cetera. Uh, today, we are continue with the special discussion about how to use RESIS, which is a software developed by Prof. Andrew Charlson. This uh, software actually guide an architect to deal with the configuration of uh, structural elements, such as uh, especially column and bearing wall. So it will be very useful to all of us, because as we know that most of architect doesn't like the structural system. I don't know what 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 is happening with the the architect, because architect uh, deal with the building, but um, some or most maybe, if I'm not wrong, they don't like structural system, especially with deal with the you know uh, earthquake and etc. So. Again, today we are lucky uh, to have Prof. Andrew Charleston and Prof. Vitoto to talk about it. So before we are starting, uh, please, uh, we are praying uh, together. Praying together, starting. Praying finish. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. In order to maximize our discussion here, I would like to strictly give a time for our professor, Andrew Charleston. So Prof. Andrew Charleston, this time is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Noor, for your introduction. And hello, um, all participants of this presentation. I hope you'll find it you know, very helpful in your studies and in your architectural practice. Um, last week, I gave my first lecture and I did talk about the different structural systems to resist earthquake. And I explained how basically there are only three structural systems that we architects have to choose from. There are load bearing walls, or shear walls. There are cross braced frames. And finally, there are moment frames. Beams and columns joined with rigid joints. And so as architects, um, the challenge is to provide a structure in each direction each or each orthogonal direction so that we can resist the earthquake attack from any direction. And uh, I finished up by showing you, introducing you to the software called Resist. Uh, it's a rule of thumb software. So there's no need to be too accurate. It's to enable you to 
approximately size the structural members so that your structure will complement or reinforce your design idea and your program. Because we don't want to leave the structural, uh, the, the civil engineer to do your preliminary design for you, because it's very likely the structural engineer will give you, you know, a very basic structure that probably won't enhance your architectural idea at all. And so it's really good if you can do your own conceptual structural design, because then as you start to think about structure, you think about your design ideas, you think about the program, you think about all the other things that make architecture. Like for example, you know, circulation. And so it's really important that as an architect, you can uh, do the preliminary structural design without any calculations, maybe just some rule of thumb calculations is all you need. And then you give your conceptual design to the engineer who will go ahead and do you know, detailed calculations, work out how much reinforcement you need and so on. But the idea is that you do the conceptual design and the detailed design is done by you know, a qualified civil engineer. It's the way it, it tends to work best. So in, at the end of uh, my last lecture, um, as I said, I introduced the software resist to you. And so I'm going to go back into that software and um, really spend the first period of this lecture giving you the opportunity to ask any questions you'd like. Maybe some of you have tried it out a little bit and you've got a few questions. Well, this would be a great opportunity, you know, to ask me. And then after a period of questions, and, and maybe some more explanation for me, then I'm going to um, go on and talk about the horizontal structure we need to resist earthquake. Because so far, I've just talked about the vertical structure, you know, frames, shear walls, brace frames. It's vertical but we also need horizontal structure. And so that'll be uh, the last part of today's presentation. So if you just excuse me, I'm going to share my resist with you. Uh, is that okay, Noor? Can you, can you see resist clearly? Yes, we can see clearly, Prof. Thank you. Can you uh, can you see my mouse, please? Yes. Great. Okay, lovely. Right, I. Well, we're all ready to go. Let, just um, to refresh your memories uh, from last week, I've. I've designed another building here on the right. And you'll see that um, the building has moment frames resisting the earthquake forces in the Y direction. And in the X direction, I'm using two structural walls of reinforced concrete. And so this is um, a little building that I'm designing the structure of at the moment. If we wanted to, if I wanted to, I could change the structural configuration and have, say, just two bays for each frame. 
Now, the frame members will be bigger because there are fewer columns and beams. But this might be, you know, a very good um, decision for, well, for my design concept. Now, I just want to point out to you that, again, that in Resist, it does not design the structure to support gravity loads. And so along this facade, or along here, uh, we'll need a series of columns and maybe beams to support the floor slabs. But Resist mainly um, enables us to design the structure to resist earthquake. So with that little um, introduction, I'll pause and, and invite any questions from you. So please, if you have any questions, um, if you want to use Bahasa Indonesia, please speak to um, Park Noor. Uh, if you want to use English, you can speak to me. So if you have any questions, please, please do ask. Otherwise, I will move on. Uh, yes, I think uh, one question from Pak Budi to Prof. Andrew. I would like to ask you about your explanation in part one, how to use the wind feature in risks. As mentioned in your software is for New Zealand. How about if you want to apply in Indonesia condition? Is any com other comparisons? Yeah, thank you. That's a, a very good question. Let's look at the wind tab. And um, the problem is that designing the wind according to the New Zealand code, and the New Zealand code has this wind map. But uh, there is the opportunity for you to know what the wind speeds are. Uh, like, for example, um, you choose a wind region and then the, the terrain type. So if you're in the city centre, you would click that. You need to put in the topography uh, as the building on flat site or on a hill or ridge or escarpment and the lee the lee zone effect only um, affects areas near mountains and i'm not sure if yogyakarta might be in a lee zone i'm not sure and then you put the elevation of your site Now, according to the wind region, resist um, assumes a certain wind speed, like the design wind speed. And, and I know that in Indonesia, your wind speeds are a lot less than in New Zealand. But, you know, what you could do is um, after you do a uh, an analysis you could go to you could go to reports and if you choose reports it tells you what the design wind speed is so like uh, for the building i'm doing now the design wind speed is 45 meters per second for the ultimate loading and so you would have to go to the Indonesian wind code and find out uh, find out what the design wind speed is 
and compare that to the wind speed that resist uses. And of course, you will find that your Indonesian wind speed will be a lot less than uh, the 45 meters per second. I don't expect that wind loads will be critical in Indonesia for any concrete building. Unless it's um, a multi-story building, say, built on the top of Mount Merapi or Mount Bromo, where, where the wind speeds would be higher. But um, if you're designing, say, a wooden building that's, say, six or eight stories high, then the wind, the wind design could be more critical than the earthquake design because your building is so light. So I think that's all I want to say um, to answer that question. Okay, so we have to know about the uh, data of wind from a uh, geometrical station, I think, isn't it, Prof. Andrew? That's right. And I would think that you would have a code that the structural engineers will use in Indonesia that will give them the design wind speed for different areas of the country. Okay. Okay, thank you, Prof. Andrew. Uh, there are many questions from one of our participants, but uh, I want, I need Bu uh, Eva Suryani from UIN Sunan Ampel, Surabaya, to write down directly on the chat, would you please? to Eva Suryani, because it's too long. <laughs> it's better, because there, are, there is a formula as well, so I can speak <laughs> formula in English. <laughs> so it's better to write on, on a chat uh, to Eva Suryani from Surabaya. OK. Uh, uh, yes, this is from Bu uh, Eva Suryani. How to create or analyze element because gravity load at resist perimeter or inside building is that influence that result? Thank you. Uh, that's a good question. Um, as, uh, as, as, as you know, um, like this building here, we have to put in additional columns. Now those columns and and maybe we would put in columns along here and a, and a beam along here to support the floor slab. Now, that column and beam structure needs to be, it can be a post and beam structure because we don't rely on it to resist earthquake. All the earthquake is resisted by these frames and these load bearing walls. But in this, but you are saying correctly that this gravity structure, it is a little, and that is true, but resist neglects that gravity structure, and so it's a slightly conservative assumption. It, it resist assumes that any gravity structure you put in will only take gravity and all the earthquake will be resisted by the structure you can see on that plan. And so in reality, your building will be a little bit stronger, but um, that's a, just a slight conservatism. And when the structural engineer comes to do the final design, um, he or she, if they want to, they can take account of that gravity structure. But for rule of thumb design, we, we can just neglect it, and it's quite safe, just slightly conservative. Okay, Prof. Andrew. Uh, another question about Pa Aldrin Fabian Shah, also same, it's, it's about the wind, wind data and wind map. I think it's already uh, answered. And from, yes, I think that's all for now. Prof. Andrew, please continue. 
Okay. Right ho. Well, uh, I, I put, before I move on to horizontal structure, I'll just um, show you the help section in Resist. There's a there's a document here called the Resist User Guide. And that gives um, guidance to users. Basically, it explains the assumptions that Resist makes. I mean, as I've said, Resist is a rule of thumb software. So it's just approximate. It's sort of like plus or minus five or 10% accurate. And this document tells you what the assumptions are. Ooh. Sorry, I, uh, there we are. Uh, the, other, the other document is, um, is a tutorial. And this document gives a step-by-step -step guide. And so if anybody's using Resist for the first time, uh, this is a step-by-step -step explanation. Um, otherwise, you can look at a YouTube video um, of, of Resist. And for, and so I just need to get out of that. And uh, finally, um, for the engineers, there's a large document called the verification manual. And that has got all the equations that we used uh, in, the, in the software. And so if you want to check out the equations, uh, anything like that, then they're all in that particular document. Perhaps I could also mention to you that, you know, resist is, is rule of thumb, it's approximate. And so you'll notice that when you design a building and resist, every floor plan has to be the same. You will also notice that every interstory height has to be the same. And so in the real world, you know, that's not often the case, is it? Um, you, often the floor plan will change at each floor level, perhaps. And some of the stories will be a bit higher or shorter than others. And so what you do is you just take the average value. Okay, you just take the average and that will give you a close enough answer to give you a really good approximation of the structure that you will need. Righto, well, I'm going to now talk about horizontal structure. Now, when the earthquake strikes, I'll just turn this around. When the earthquake shakes the building in the y direction, the earthquake forces are resisted by these moment frames. There's seven of them. And the forces have to be transferred at every floor level into, the, into each moment frame. And so it's really important that our floors are strong enough to act like horizontal beams to transfer the forces uh, horizontally and sideways into each of the moment frames. Now, if the moment frames are quite close together, it means it's very easy for our floor slab to do that because the floor slab only has to span the distance between the moment frames. 
But now I'm going to change the configuration of the structure. Uh, I'm going to remove most of the moment frames. And I'm, now I'm going to assume that in this building, all the earthquake forces are resisted on just three frames. Now I'm going to have to make them a lot stronger because there are only three of them. And so the column, the columns are going to be a lot, need to be a lot stronger. They'll look something like that. And so now when the earthquake strikes in the y direction, when the building is shaking in the y direction, the earthquake forces are resisted on three lines. And now the floor slab has to span horizontally like half the length of the building. And that puts a lot more stress into the floor slab. And of course, the situation would be a lot worse if I remove if I remove this and I make the end moment frame stronger, that they look like this. So the columns would be perhaps about a meter, like that. So now when an earthquake strikes, all the forces at each floor level have to be transferred into this frame and into that frame. And so it makes each of the floor slabs have to function as these big horizontal beams, transferring the inertia forces into the frames. Now, this particular solution would mean that within the, within the plan of the building, we would have quite a, quite a large number of, of columns to resist the gravity load. And these columns could be quite slender. They could be quite a lot smaller than a normal column because they don't have to resist earthquake they just have to resist compression and a little bit of bending. And so that means if we have structure, say at each end of the building, okay, the structure is big and strong, but all the gravity structure elsewhere in the building, it can be very slender. And so, if, for example, you wanted to have maximum transparency in the middle of your building with the minimum of um, column dimensions, well, this would be an excellent strategy for you. You'd be withstanding the earthquake at each end of your building, but you do need the strong horizontal floor structure to transfer transfer the forces into those frames. So I'm just going to pause and see if any of you have any questions uh, before I move on. Yes, Prof. Andrew, uh, there are some uh, participants asking about how to get this software. Can you explain? I can. Uh, I think I've got a slide I will show in a minute, okay? Well, actually, I will, I will answer that question now. So um, if you excuse me, I will just um, stop sharing. Oh no, what I can do is, um, yeah, I have to stop sharing the screen.
and I'm going to share another screen with you. And I'm just going to show you the, um, the website, the link. So there's the, the link for the free download of Resist. Okay, maybe a participant can take a picture from this slide. Please. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> Now, Noor, do you have any other questions I should answer at this time? Okay, let's check. Uh, uh, not yet, Prof, but uh, maybe I want to open Profitoto, yes, Profitoto, you have something to ask? Profitoto, please. Okay, thank you. Do you hear my voice? Yes, thank you. That's okay. Uh, Professor Andrew, thank you very much for your uh, sharing your software. Uh, to Indonesian architect. Uh, in Indonesia, we fully adopt the earth resistant design uh, to American Society of Civil Engineer ISE. So, yes. uh, if we use your uh, software, then uh, it should be modified or at least you know, because uh, maybe uh, we have little bit different between New Zealand standard and ISTE or Indonesian standard. So that's it is never mind. It's no, no problem because uh, maybe in this uh, software is used for preliminary design. Exactly. That's its only. Yeah. That's its only purpose for preliminary design. Yeah, and the most important thing for uh, Indonesian young architects, uh, particularly to understand the behavior of the structure, is that maybe uh, calculus calculation is. Uh, in the responsibility of civil engineer. But uh, what we have to do is the joint cooperation between architect and engineer. Uh, particularly uh, in Indonesia, uh, particularly, uh, more important uh, to uh, give them, particularly in the building configuration. So it's not really calculation. Your calculation usually is just a responsibility of the civil engineer. But uh, take part in the discussion of uh, building configuration, so the shape, the type of the structure, and then the size of the column, distance of the uh, column, uh, or the uh, beam uh, uh, span, you know. 
that's very important for the young architect in Indonesia. I think that that's okay. Uh, uh, you give us a uh, software, but uh, it's useful also for primary design. But for the real design, we have to follow fully uh, Indonesian perfect design, design principle. Thank you. Yeah, ab absolutely, uh, Professor Widodo. I totally agree. Um, I explained earlier on that this is just for conceptual design. And then the architects would um, hand over their conceptual design to a civil engineer who would do, you know, a, a, an accurate analysis, an accurate design, and do the detailing and finish off the working drawings. So, yeah, it's a collaboration. And I mean, ideally, um, it would be great if the architect and engineer could use resist together, uh, because the engineer would be able to give guidance and just add more value to the process of um, sort, sorting out the configuration, the structural configuration of the building. Any more questions at this stage, Nor, or should I move on? Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes, hello. I'm afraid that hello. it's very hard to hear you, Professor Wadodo. <laughs> It's not clear, it might be because of a disaster of school. Hello, hello. Participant yang lain, Pak Nur. Hello. And unfortunately, your microphone is sort of breaking down and we can't hear you clearly. Maaf Pak Nur, mikrofonnya di, dihidupkan dulu, di unmute. Mikrofonnya di unmute dulu Pak Nur. Uh. Okay, Prof. Prof. Andrew Charleston, please continue your presentations. Okay, thank you. Righto. Well, now I'm going to move on to possibly the third part of uh, these presentations and talk about horizontal configuration of buildings. And we're going to um, imagine we're designing this building at the top of the screen in the Y direction earthquake shaking is resisted by two structural walls. Or if we wanted to, they could be two moment frames or two braced frames. And so I've drawn a cross section through the building, um, cutting in the Y direction. And this is the section here. And it shows the earthquake inertia forces during the shaking. Like these are the earthquake inertia forces 
on the column or on the columns on that line. Here are the inertia forces on the columns of this line. And here are the inertia forces on these columns. And also the inertia forces from the cladding, you know, be it glazing or masonry. And finally, here are the inertia forces caused by the mass of the floor slab. And actually, these are the greatest forces because about 80% of the weight of a building is in the floor slabs. So during the earthquake shaking, these are the forces we see in cross section acting in the Y direction, this direction. Now, if we draw these forces on the plan of the building, they look like this. These are the forces from the inertia caused by the mass of the columns and the exterior wall. Here are the same inertia forces on the other side of the building from the columns and exterior wall. And all these forces in the middle of the plan, they are the inertia forces acting as a result of the mass of the floor slab and beams and internal columns. And so these are all the forces acting in the Y direction during the shaking. And so for equilibrium of this floor slab, these forces are resisted by the strength and reaction of the end structures. In this case, the two end structural walls. And so in this scenario, the floor slab is acting like a horizontal beam. You can see I've drawn its deflection. Um, like that's it's the, the deflection of the floor slab. It's acting like a horizontal beam. And in that situation, we describe the floor slab as a floor diaphragm. A diaphragma, I think you, you say in Bahasa. So that is the, um, those are showing all the forces or the horizontal forces acting in plan. That's the, oh, here they are here. Yeah, so this is just an enlarged section uh, showing all the forces acting in this frame. Uh, so in fact, this frame here that I've drawn, that is like a gravity frame. It's not designed to resist the earthquake because the shear walls are, but not, nonetheless, it will bend like that. Um, but the shear walls will be doing most of the resistance because they've been designed for that reason. And so here again are the, the two shear walls and the forces acting. Now, we can simplify this diagram. We can replace the shear walls like with supports here and here. And the floor diaphragm, it can be represented like as a simply supported beam loaded with these inertia forces. And so if we have a beam on two supports with a uniformly distributed load like this, well, this is the deflected shape. This is the shear force diagram. And this is the bending moment diagram. And so every floor has to be able to function as a strong diaphragm. 
which means a strong horizontal beam, transferring the uniformly distributed loads sideways into the, the vertical structure, be it shear walls or moment frames. And so the principle is this, that the further apart in plan the vertical structure, the stronger the diaphragm must be. That's the, the key principle here. Now, if we're dealing with a steel structure or the roof of a building, and we're not using a concrete slab, well, then we have to design um, our own horizontal diaphragms. And this structure shown here, you, you, we could imagine it as being like on the roof of a multi-story building. Um, with, or say it might be quite a light roof, could have tiles on it, it could have, um, plywood and, and a membrane on it. Anyway, if, if the inertia forces are acting in the Y direction, well, we have to design a horizontal diaphragm to transfer the Y direction inertia forces to the side of the building so the inertia forces, in this case, can be resisted by say, steel bracing. And so normally in a building like this, our roof diaphragm would consist of horizontal trusses like this. I mean, if we wanted to, we could have bracing in every bay, but that would probably be too strong. And so I haven't shown any bracing in this middle bay. If we wanted to, we could just make our diaphragm this size, one bay deep. But of course, the members and the connections would have to be twice as strong. But that's a decision we as architects can make. And so in this scenario, the intermediate frames of this roof, here and here, they are designed just to resist gravity and wind, wind uplift, not earthquake. And so the earthquake forces have to be transferred sideways past these frames and down into the bracing at each end of the building. So this is an example of a cross-braced diaphragm that we very often use in I, sh I should just say, um, let me just, I should just say that the next step is to design the diaphragm in the X direction. And so to create a diaphragm in the X direction, we would need cross bracing in that bay. I'm sorry. And also say in that bay. But this slide is just giving the explanation of designing the steel cross brace diaphragm in the Y direction. I'll just pause uh, Pagnor and see if there are any questions at this stage. Okay, Prof, uh, there are at least two questions from Pa Budi, the first one. Uh, I would like to ask to Prof. Andrew, when you have very long span beam, do we need to put strong beam to transfer the gravity load to the resistance frame? 
Could you please read that again? When you have very long span beam, do we need to put strong beam in order to transfer the gravity load to the resistance frame? I can't quite visualize the situation, I'm sorry. It would be helpful if there was a little sketch. Yeah, maybe uh, related to the long span, actually, uh, because maybe if we make a long span building, it should be uh, capable to bear gravity load, isn't it? But yes, how, definitely. Yeah, how to deal with the uh, earthquake if we have something like this? What, what okay. is your suggestion? Okay, well, see this beam here? That's a long span beam. Like that beam could be 20 or 30 meters long. So there's a long span beam. And in this case, it's sitting on a steel post or a reinforced concrete column or post. And so this steel beam is supporting the roof, say, say the roof. And so this, this frame is unstable. And so we need to use the steel cross brace diaphragm with bracing in the wall here to give stability to this post and beam in the Y direction. And when it comes to X direction shaking, well, I mean, this frame is incredibly uh, vulnerable to falling over. And so we need some cross bracing here to stabilize the beam in the X direction. And then all these can be transferred maybe to some bracing at this point here. So, so that's how yeah. you combine so like not a beam. Only the beam. Not only the beam itself, but also we have to connect with another frame, you mean? Exactly, because the beam is only good for gravity loads. Mm -hmm. Yes. Whereas during an earthquake, the beam and all the area around the beam will experience horizontal loads from the earthquake shaking. Okay. Okay, Prof. Uh, thank you for your answer. Uh, another question is from pa Frankie Pondak. Uh, I'm very interested about nonlinear structure and in my research for earthquake model, I found difficult problem with the instability of the depth soil. When I applied in nonlinear structure, especially in extreme architecture, how should I do? Thank you. Uh, from Frank Pondak of Sulawesi. Well, uh, deal with, with the soil, with the depth soil, with the deep soil. Oh, I see. Yeah, well, I think you have to maybe get some advice from a geotechnical engineer and talk, discuss together how you could best, you know, model the soft soil. You know, will you? model it using a combination of springs and dampers to deal with the non-linearity. I mean, there, there are probably quite a few different techniques. But um, look, this is a very technical question. And because most of the participants are architects, I, I think it's not good for me to um, go into too much detail. So please, have some conversations with some geotechnical engineers. Yes, yes. Actually, 
Thank you, Prof. Andrew, because maybe uh, Mr. Frankie is a civil engineer. <laughs> He's talking about two technical <laughs> things. <laughs> and he also mentioned about the construction of structural system for the tot, uh, toll road uh, beyond the sea. So it's related to the how to make a foundation on the sea soil. <laughs> it is something less. And okay, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's all for a moment. Yes, Prof. Vitrata, you have uh, opinion about no. this? Yes, please. Uh, talking about soil and connecting with structure, that's very interesting, particularly for the civil engineer, because discussion is uh, come to the soil structure interaction. So this interaction is not uh, actually it's quite interesting, but not so many people know well about soil structure interaction. Uh, what Professor Andrew said is that's right. Uh, it should be discussed uh, intensively with the uh, technical engineer, but also uh, because technical engineering also wide uh, uh, problem in discussion, you know. So uh, this this case particularly in in. Uh, soft soil, you know, we have to be careful, uh, particularly in the design of the foundation, because on the soil, uh, in engineering, particularly, on the soil should be still uh, elastic to the earth uh, So that's where uh, usually we put or we give a relatively high uh, factor of safety in designing the foundation. Uh, in our new code, for example, if the soil is quite weak and the location is near the earthquake fault, then the analysis should be come to the site-specific uh, analysis. So it's, 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 it's very, very specific. It needs the uh, Good competency in this in this case. Anyway, good luck for our discussion because this this thing is not very easy to be discussed. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Widodo. Yes, you're right. So in order to deal with the soil, with the sea soil, etc., I think we have to see civil. Uh, engineering to do that, to calculate everything there. Uh, once more from Pak Budi, uh, he means from long span slab, Prof. Andrew. If we have long span slab, what do you think about that? What What is your suggestion? Do we need another frame to put, or we, not, we need to make it uh, wider? Oh, sorry, uh, tight, more tight, more height or what your suggestion well it's not very good practice to have long spanning slabs because they become quite deep or quite thick and um, they they're incredibly heavy and they use a lot of concrete so usually if you're trying to span a large area with a slab, it's best to try and use secondary beams and then have a thinner slab spanning between your secondary beams. And so the normal strategy for gravity resistance is to have your slab and then you have your secondary beams which frame into your primary beams. You know, that's the, that's the normal way we would uh, build and reinforce concrete. 
Okay. So, Might your suggestion not to make a long span because it can create a thick slab. Yeah. Okay. Prof. Vidoda, you have I, a comment? May I give additional comment, please? Yes, please. Yeah. If you're dealing with very long slab, we have uh, several possibilities. First, you can make it uh, pre-stressed uh, slab, you know, that right now in Jakarta is not very often, but in big city like Jakarta or Surabaya, something like that, the pre-stressed slab is uh, very common. Firstly, it can be used a uh, uh, pre-stressed uh, slab, you know. Secondly, Professor Andrew several times said to us that our structure should be stiff enough. Is that right, Professor Andrew? Please, could you repeat that? Uh, you said several times that our structure should be stiff enough. Um, well, that's the that's the structure to resist um, earthquake loads. It's got to be stiff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this stiff enough. So that's it. Whenever you have a very long uh, span slab, actually, uh, particle in the earthquake prone area, so the structural system should be supported by very strong uh, structural system either by a brisk frame or by structural wall or by combination uh, between frame and wall. So uh, if we dealing with long span, we have to be careful as well, not only for the horizontal load, but also for vertical load. So, yes, uh, in long span or beam or slab, you know, that's very vulnerable for uh, vertical vibration, mm. particularly for the uh, uh, location that uh, near the earthquake source like Yogyakarta because we have OPA fault uh, just located around less than 10 kilometers from Yogyakarta city. So we have to be careful don't make it the slab or beams too long because uh, uh, the vertical deflection will be very high and also very vulnerable with the uh, vertical vibration. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Vitada, for your additional explanation about the slab. Okay, yes, next. Comments. Okay, uh, one question more, Prof. Andrew, just to confirm that is your software could accommodate various load and combination? Oh, yes, it, it um, includes all the load combinations that a normal international code would do. So it's sort of state of the art in terms of taking into account load combinations. And as Park Wadodo mentioned earlier, resist is um, written in accordance with the New Zealand codes. And so there will be slight variation with the Indonesian codes, but the answers will be close enough for preliminary design. Okay, thank you, Prof. Anderson, Prof. Andrew Charleston. Would you please to continue your ex uh, presentations? Okay, thank you. So I've just explained to you, um, particularly when we're designing roofs of buildings, the need to provide cross brace diaphragm structure at the roof level. Now I want to um, talk about P 
penetrations in diaphragms. And I've got a building with two structural walls at each end of the floor slabs. And I'm just going to discuss earthquake shaking in the Y direction. Now, as I explained before, when the ground shakes in the Y direction, the slab has to function as a diaphragm. In other words, like a horizontal beam, transferring the forces to the right-hand shear wall and to the left-hand wall. But if there is a big notch in the floor diaphragm, say to accommodate stairs or an atrium, then this notch, it destroys the beam action of the diaphragm. I mean, this notch is like putting a notch into a normal beam. It's a disaster. And so one option is to continue the beams through like this. And if the beams are continuous through the notch, then this diaphragm can resist the bending moments. It's strong enough. So this is okay. This is dangerous. Now, what about if the penetration is right by the structural wall? Well, that is a problem because the inertia forces are trying to get into the wall, but they, they are unable to do that because of this penetration. And so all the forces will concentrate in these bits of the floor slab and the floor slab will probably fail. It'll probably break and it could collapse. And so this also is quite dangerous. However, this is the optimal location of a penetration. In the middle of a floor slab, it's not affecting the cords of the diaphragm. And so the bending moments uh, can be resisted, no problem at all. So this is okay. These two are potentially uh, dangerous. Now, um, a note about torsion. This is a plan of a building on the corner of two streets. Here's one street here and another street. And in most buildings on corners, on these boundaries, there will be strong walls for firewalls. And then there will be columns and beams elsewhere in the plan. Now, the problem is that for horizontal earthquake shaking, the strongest element in the Y direction is this wall. And so all of the earthquake forces will be resisted by this wall. But the earthquake forces, they act at the center of mass of the floor slab. And yet they are resisted at the center of resistance on this line. And so we've got what we call eccentricity. The force acts here, it's resisted here. The whole of the slab will twist. The whole building will twist. It will experience torsion. And as it twists, these columns, they, these ones in particular, will have to um, deflect a long distance and they will probably get very badly damaged. 
So what would we have to do to make this building perform better in an earthquake? Well, first of all, uh, we would have to, what I'm suggesting is, if this is a new building, we make the firewalls non-structural. So these firewalls, uh, they are not structural walls. They might be concrete block, um, something like that. Fire resistant, but not part of the structure. And ideally the, the walls, if they were infills, they would be separated from the frame. So now in the Y direction, we would have a good moment frame along here and a good moment frame along here. And this wall would be non-structural. And so the center of mass of the building would be the same in the middle of the plan, more or less. And the earthquake forces would be resisted on this line because there's equal strength here and here. And so now we have a configuration where there's no significant torsion. And the same happens if the earthquake shakes in the X direction. It's resisted by this moment frame here and this one here. And so again, no torsion for shaking in the X direction. These columns are quite small. They are just resisting gravity load. And they can be really quite slender. And if we wanted to, we don't need any beams here. We could just have a flat slab, uh, a flat slab construction, which doesn't require beams, but just the slabs transferring the loads directly into the columns. Um, I'll just pause and take any questions. Are there any questions, Pak Noor? Up to now, not yet, Prof. Okay. Let me talk about re-entrant corners. All of these four buildings have re-entrant corners. This is a this is a re-entrant corner. That's a re-entrant corner. And the, there's a, a problem with buildings of this configuration because of the re-entrant corners. What's the problem? Well, here's a building plan with a re-entrant corner here. And so when the building shakes in the Y direction, this like wing of the building, it sort of goes floppy. See how it swings? And like there's a large deflection at this end, whereas in the body of the building, the deflection is quite small. And so we often get serious damage in this area of the floor slabs. And it's all because of the different stiffness. This part of the building is more flexible than this part. And this is explained on this three-dimensional model. This part of the building, it shakes further than this part. So re-entrant corners um, are something that architects should avoid. So how do, we, how do we avoid them? Well, actually it's quite simple. We have seismic separation gaps. And so if you've got a building plan in the shape of an H, an H shape, here we've got four re-entrant corners. 
Well, what we do in practice is we, we separate. We separate this building into three structures. And we provide a physical gap between each structure. Now, nobody apart from us need know about these gaps because you can cover them and you can make the architecture look like it's unified. And so your project has unified architecture, but it actually has three separated structures. And each structure has to look after itself. This structure here, it has to have structure in the y direction and the x direction. This building, this structure here needs resistance in the y direction and x direction and so on. And so this is what practicing architects do to avoid the problem of these re-entrant corners. They create these seismic separation gaps. And so if you are designing a project with re-entrant corners, quite early in your design, you need to have a conversation with your structural engineer because the engineer will guide you as to what this distance is. And the width, the width of this gap, it depends on the height of the building and its flexibility. The higher the building and the more flexible, the bigger this gap is. And I mean, like in a 10 story building that is flexible, this gap might have to be as much as 40 centimeters. You know, it's quite a big gap. And we have to accommodate that in our design and our detailing as architects. Any, any questions to be answered? Uh, not Prof. Andrew, but um, maybe for myself, uh, if we have set, for example, yes, a plan like this, it should be kept between one part and another part. What about setback building? So how we make this gap between uh, the tower, let's say, and surrounding uh, additional uh, uh, buildings? Well, that's a really good question. Um, See so here, here's our building um, in plan. This is the street frontage, and these are the site boundaries. And so if we look at the building in elevation, we've got to create a seismic gap between the sides of our building and the boundary line. Otherwise, during an earthquake, our building is going to move sideways and it's going to pound the neighbor's building. It's going to into the neighbor's building. And so every architect should allow a seismic gap here so that your building, it doesn't go over the boundary and hit the neighbor's building. Okay, uh, Prof. Andrew, what about the 
the uh, popular building which is uh, constructed by high rise no, not high rise but multi story building and low rise building together so we have to make a cap as well i think i might discuss that um, let's just wait and see uh, No, I, I don't discuss it, but um, yes, some, some um, engineers would recommend a gap between the tower and the podium. Yes. And that's right, some engineers would recommend that, but other engineers would say that they can design it so that you don't need a gap. Hmm. But it, it's just a matter of having this conversation with your structural engineer. Hello. And to get together, you can um, make a decision. Oh, okay. Provida, though, can adding something? Please. Okay. Can you please properly? Okay, please, but even Hello, though you not, my not, yes, not so clear your, your voice still, Prof, unfortunately. Hello? Uh, regarding, regarding with SNRC, what Professor Andrew said that in our current Indonesian uh, design, but we have already considered three dimensional structure. So we have already considered about the uh, existing eccentricity, and also we have to consider the unexpected eccentricity. So, about the eccentricity, I think we don't have a problem anymore because the Consider in the go in space design code, and if we dealing with uh, complex uh, building plan, uh, what the professor are presenting, uh, actually we don't have any problem anymore because in structural analysis we have to check everything. We have to check the uh, building. Regularity, uh, both horizontal and vertical. We have to check as well the interstory brick. We have to check as well the. Uh, I'm sorry, your voice is no. not uh, clear enough, so we cannot understand what you saying. So, uh, I'm sorry about that, Prof. Vidata. Okay, uh, from other participants, if we make a cap, Prof. Andrew, uh, is it uh, how many, I mean, is that any ratio between height and the cap itself? Because sometimes it can hitting each other from Pak Nasruddin Junus. Yeah, I mean, I'll go back to that slide. Now, the width of the gap, it depends on the height of the building and its flexibility. And um, the gap, the, maxim, the maximum gap will be like about 2% of the building height. So Sorry? if your building is say 10 stories, 10 stories by, by 3.5 meters, 
uh, by 350 centimeters. Then the gap has to be 70 centimeters. 70. 70. So yeah. the, this, the proportion is one over one the over is is um is two percent two percent yeah two percent from the height of the buildings yeah but okay. but that is the maximum like possible gap if you want a smaller gap you have to ask your engineer to help you design a stiffer structure so say, for example, this building here is relying on um, rather flexible moment frames. And say the gap is 70 centimeters. And that, that's too much for you and your client. And so you could say, well, look, please engineer, can you make my building stiffer so that we can reduce the width of the gap? And the engineer would say, yes, I can make your frames stiffer so that the gap can be smaller. Or the engineer could say, I can make your gap even smaller than that if we use structural walls. So we as designers have got the freedom to adjust the flexibility of our structure to reduce the width of that gap. Of Andrew, uh, there is a question from pa Java related this gap. Uh, is it possible not using gap, but make uh, instead uh, to make a stronger constructions on this part? Is it possible to do that? Well, yes, it is, because if you had very strong structure, the movement at the top of your building will be very little. And therefore, the gap can be very little. But you always will need some gap, because during an earthquake, the building will always move to and fro, you know, like this. And, and as I'm going to explain, this is what we have to avoid. We have to avoid pounding. Can you see that pounding? See that damage? Where the buildings were pounding each other because the gap was not enough. Mm. And I mean, imagine if you were living in this living in this building on the right. I mean, you'd probably be killed because of the pounding. And so in every earthquake in an urban area, we see buildings that pound each other especially old buildings where, there's, where there are no seismic gaps between the buildings. They will pound each other, you know, and they will, they, they don't usually cause a building to collapse, but they can cause quite nasty damage, like, like what happened to this building here um, in the Mexico City earthquake in about 1980. So do we need to make the uh, same uh, rigidity between these two buildings? So in the same earthquake, they will uh, swing uh, similarly. Is it possible like that? It's not really practical to do that because the buildings have different owners and you'd have to tie the buildings together to make them move together. So in theory, that would solve the problem, yes. If we could tie these buildings together, then they would move together in phase and they wouldn't pound. 
but but in practice we need to build each building away from the boundary to create that gap and then um, we then we are fairly confident that our building is not going to cross the boundary and smash into the neighbor's building for the single building owner single owner uh, professor andrew what what you suggestion for detailing this gap between one part to another part well actually um they're very, they're very it's a very easy detail like like this gap it's opened up after the earthquake but like before the earthquake there should be a gap like this and so the building owners they they close the gap with a flexible material a flexible like it could be a, a neoprene or a rubber flashing that can stretch and compress and um in my book i think uh, seismic design for architects i i probably give some details of how you um how an architect will will have flexible flashing to close the gap so it's it's not visible okay what about the foundation professor is it what kind of gap uh, we have to put there from nafari nafan i don't think you need a gap at the foundation level the foundations i think can be built close together because it's only at the top of a building that you we get this relative movement that causes pounding so i don't think we need to separate um, our foundations we just you know we don't connect them because we don't connect into anybody else's property but we just are a, we're allowed to build um, you know our foundations close to the foundation close to the boundary okay it was from pak jafar as well okay uh, uh, okay prof andrew from pak budi is emergency there need to be have a gap emergency stair what do you mean pak budi uh, i don't know what you mean but uh, maybe uh, is is well, that... I, I can ex i can yes, explain please, please, i mean please. it's a really good question uh Like here's some stairs in a building, and during an earthquake, the building is going to sway, and it's important that the stairs do not form a, like a diagonal structure here, a diagonal member. And so, what we do is that we we separate the stairs and um, in practice well like i'll show you this um, this diagram here see how during an earthquake um a building in the moment frames they sway to and fro and so that's why like if you have an infill wall and we often separate it from the frame so that the frame can sway to and fro without being affected by the infill wall now if we have a stair here 
the top of the stair is going to move to and fro and it's going to cause a lot of damage to the stair. And so if we have a stair, we, we let it slide. And so I don't know if you can see, but here's a little model. My pen is the stair and, and it can just slide on the floor beneath when the building sways to and fro. So we, we have a sliding joint, usually on our stairs, so that when the building moves to and fro, then the stairs don't get damaged. I hope that explains. Okay. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, so the stair will have this diagonal to make it more rigid uh, frame, is it? Well, the stairs, if, if the stairs are strongly connected at the top and bottom, the stairs will act as a diagonal structural member but they're not designed to be a structural member like that. And so they will get damaged. They will get very seriously damaged if they are not um, able to slide at one end. And in my book, Seismic Design for Architects, I give the very simple details to allow a stair to slide and therefore avoid damage. Okay, so uh, we should allow, we should allow or we have, uh, we have to connect uh, which one is better? Uh, because in, in the previous one, you're uh, talking about the dia diagonal and then uh, you suggest uh, you oh, allow yeah. Uh, slicks connections. That's right. Um, this is bad. This is this is like a dangerous scenario. This is bad because the stairs are strongly connected at the top and the bottom. What we need to do is to to connect them strongly, say at the top, and and just let them slide here. Hmm. This it. It should just slide there and there, sliding, a sliding joint. And so we just might have um, some plastic, a sheet of plastic between the floor slab and the stair. That's all we need, just a really simple sliding joint. Okay, so the, the principle for this joint is to make a roll, roll connection, isn't it? Correct. Okay. Okay, that's a question from Pak Buti. So, from Pak Bambang Subekti, can we know about slenderness ratio between width and height in tall building to guide an, to guide an architect? Uh, I don't. I don't think there's really um, a ratio that we can use because we can have a very slender building uh, if we use high technology. For example, if you want a very slender tower, um, you might have to use like tuned mass dampers or some other high-tech solution. So I think, I think um, the idea is that at an early stage of design, this is where you need to have um, collaboration okay. with the engineer yeah. to discuss with the engineer, you know, what are the, what's the maximum practical height you can go to without needing a 
very expensive structural solution. Okay, thank you, Prof. So that's all. Uh, please to continue. Okay, well, I just want to say a few words about diaphragm discontinuities. Like here's a, a well-configured building. Uh, this is the floor diaphragm. And once again, we've got say two shear walls or two moment frames. These would just be gravity columns and beams. And then say the architect wants to put a slot here. Now that means that it's impossible for the inertia forces in the diaphragms to transfer into the wall or the frame here, because this is a gap. And so I'm just giving, so potentially this is a very dangerous um, configuration. And so I'm just going to suggest a couple of solutions. Like if you wanted an open area here, what you could do is you could create like some bracing here in the floor plane so that the inertia forces at this end of the building can go through the bracing into the shear wall or the moment frame. Or if you didn't like cross bracing, you could put a Vierendeel frame here. And so the inertia forces can get transferred through the frame member. It's a horizontal frame into the vertical shear wall or moment frame. Now diaphragms, you know, are really important in buildings. And here's a cross section of a building in Italy uh, that is, has been built. And, and you can see that in, in cross section, it looks very unstable, doesn't it? because all the gravity loads are transferred down to this point here. And yet, as I said, this building uh, is standing, it's been built in Italy, and it is able to withstand the wind forces. But I mean, imagine the wind blowing on the sides of this building, the building would just fall over, wouldn't it? It would just overturn. It would just pivot about this point here. But the building actually is stable because of the strength of these floor diaphragms. That's what stabilizes it. And so here's the building. You can see the points. These um, They're like sort of inverted cones, aren't they? And, and they're true points here. And so this part of the building is like very unstable, but the diaphragms anchor back into some structural walls at each end. And so when the wind blows or if there's an earthquake, there's no earthquake force going through these pin joints. All the earthquake force is resisted by the floor diaphragm at each level and transferred into the safety of these shear walls at the at each, excuse me, at each end. And so this building, it just illustrates the power and the strength of floor diaphragms. Uh, Park Noor, is there another question? Uh, no. Please continue. 
Okay, well, I've just about finished the lecture because now I come to the subject of pounding, but I've already discussed that um, as I answered your questions. And, um, you know, I've already shown you this example of pounding um, in Mexico City, but in every earthquake, there will be pounding if you look for it. And as I said, the solution is to create these gaps around the boundary lines of your site. You, you don't need to have a gap along the street because the city council, it doesn't mind if your building sways into the street during an earthquake, okay? It allows that. So you don't need a gap at the front of your building, but you do need gaps against these three boundary lines. And actually, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. Andrew Sarlesson. So it was very nice presentation from you and uh, good uh, discussion as well with the participants. Uh, there is one a participant that would like to have further communication with you, if you don't mind. Uh, it seemed that uh, she would like to do PhD, if I'm not wrong, or further uh, research about earthquake and architectural st structures. So oh, <laughs> if you don't mind, he, yes, she would like to uh, contact with you. Okay, yes. Prof. Andrew. Yes, please. Um, I please ask that person to email me. Okay, thank you very much. I will give your email to her. Thank you. Yes. Okay. I, I just warn her that um, I am now retired from Victoria University, like a couple of years ago. So I won't personally be supervising her, but I can um, I can um, introduce her to one of my colleagues who would be a very good supervisor. Thank you very much from Prof. Andrew Charleston. So it was, uh, once again, it was very good uh, presentation from you. Uh, uh, Prof. Widodo, uh, do you still uh, monitor us? Prof. Widodo. It, it seemed that uh, he is not connected yet uh, again. <laughs> Lost connections. Oh, Widodo, please. Hello, thank you very much. I think a uh, very, very good uh, lecture today what we are going to understand the uh, behavior of the structure, uh, particularly that given by Professor Andrew. And uh, I think uh, what Professor Andrew said that uh, it is possibility for him to supervise the uh, undergraduate or master thesis, it will be very good for us, but uh, normally. Yes, yes, Prof. Yes, uh, we may in the future have uh, more further collaboration with Prof. Andrew and Prof. Vitodo to deal with this topic. Are you? Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> Are you? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Okay, uh, this is the end of the, the webinar for this session. Uh, Prof. Andrew, uh, you will have one another session, but not in the near uh, times. I think after sometimes. 
and okay. I will I will discuss with you later on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, our appreciation, great appreciation for uh, Prof. Andrew to have uh, time with us and also Prof. Pitato. So uh, thank you very much once again uh, for your uh, very nice presentation today. And before we are going to finish this session, uh, I would like to ask all participants to open your camera so we can take a picture from all participants. Okay, so please open your camera for all participants, if you don't mind, of course. Hello, all, all participants, would you please open your camera right now? Okay, uh, still no more. We are waiting for others. Okay, Mbak Nisa, please take a picture for all participants. Okay, done, Mbak Anissa. Okay, thank you very much for all participants for your participation. Of course, uh, we still have one session with uh, Professor Andrew Charleson. It will be after Hari Raya, after Idul Fitri, of course. We don't have a schedule yet, but uh, please make sure that the, the final one will be very, very interesting with Prof. Andrew Charleson, isn't it, Prof. Andrew? And I for, hope so. <laughs> for Prof. Vidoto, also, thank you very much. Uh, you joined with us. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to close the sessions. Uh, selamat uh, menunaikan ibadah puasa dan selamat uh, Idul Fitri. Mohon maaf lahir batin uh, atas segala hal yang terjadi. Oleh karena itu, marilah kita uh, bersama-sama menutup uh, sesi uh, kedua dari Prof. Andrew ini dengan bacaan Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillahirrohmanirrohim. So for all our participation, thank you very much once again. So we see you after Idul Fitri Bayrams. So Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Prof. Andrew, thank you very much. Prof. Vidoto, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Been a pleasure.